Avi, it's great to be here uh, again with you at a, a conference, this time on, on fine-tuning in, in, in physics, the physics of fine-tuning. Um, I've been following fine-tuning for, for several decades. Uh, in its use in the philosophical science theology debates over, over the years, uh, whether it's relevant or not, and as we see fine-tuning now becoming more central as an issue among mainstream physicists and, uh, and cosmologists, as you are, um, uh, what can we say about the application of fine-tuning that some would do to, to generate rather grand philosophical uh, conclusions, uh, whether they be theological or anti-theological, um, is, is, is there some legitimacy in that? Well, there is a lot of interest among philosophers and theologians uh, to make the point that we are special, that the uh, conditions were tailored so that we would exist the way we are. And if they can find evidence for that uh, from physics, from astronomy, that would be great because it would emphasize, it would set the stage uh, for emphasizing the fact that there is something special about us that was arranged in advance in order for us to exist the way we are. Now, the problem is that the astronomers, as they search for life, might find life elsewhere. Different forms of life or similar forms of life under other different conditions. And then the question is, are we special? Are we unique? Or are, is life very common out there such that you won't really need fine-tuning to explain the existence of life? Obviously, if you are very specific and you want to argue uh, about the conditions that were necessary for us to come into the scene, then uh, you will end up with uh, fine-tuning. But more generally, it's possible that uh, nothing was really designed for us especially in the cosmic scene. This is not a stage that was set up for us. We happen to be bypassers uh, in this scenery, and it was not set for us. Some theologians uh, even would say that if, if the universe is indeed biofriendly, which I, I, I think is a position that you, you would uh, uh, at least hope for or, or give credence to in terms of the number of exoplanets that we see and the time spans necessary, that if, if the universe is indeed life-friendly, then that means uh, a, a greater God that sees beyond humanity. So maybe the theologians who were just focused on humanity had it wrong, but the big the theology is that God has, has made a, a bio-friendly, bio-rich universe that can generate all kinds of life and this is an even greater grandeur. I, I think the most remarkable thing about the universe is that it's organized. When I go into my daughter's room in the morning, I often find a mess. Uh -huh. And it would have been much more likely for us to look around at the sky and find a mess. Uh, things that we cannot explain, conditions that are not organized, and that we cannot uh, really uh, simulate on our computers. However, we find going all the way back 10 billion years or all the way to the edge of the observable universe, we find that the same laws of physics can account for all the phenomena, most of the phenomena that we see. And that's remarkable in my view, uh, that there is this order, the organization. Uh, it should not be taken for granted, as many physicists uh, do, uh, because the, or the other type of laws that we are familiar with were made by humans. And we, we know how often these laws are broken. Um, and so the fact that nature meticulously follows the laws of physics is remarkable. Now, does it signify anything? Perhaps. That's something to think about. Spinoza identified nature, the organized form of nature, with God. And uh, if you make this identification, I wouldn't argue with it. I would say that it's something to be admired and studied. But it's not because necessarily there was a separate entity responsible for it. It's more to do with the fact that reality, the way we see it, 
is not messy. Uh, and I, I find that remarkable. Every day when I think about the, my research, I find it remarkable that we can apply the laws of physics we learn about from experiments on Earth to the universe at large. There are two ways we can we can look at that that the, that the laws of physics uh, are, uh, are are regular and repeatable. We we can look at it as sort of like metaphor, and that it's very it's very nice as a brute fact about the world. And a lot of physicists do to try to do what I would call pseudo theology, uh, that you're trying to give meaning to kind of mi mimic the theology with something real that we know. The other approach, which I think is the Spinoza approach that you refer to, is, is really believing that the, the totality of the laws has a higher dimensional spirituality or something in reality, not just as metaphor. So which are you suggesting? I would uh, sympathize with the second approach. Um, as a young kid, I was mostly uh, interested in philosophical questions for that reason, because they address uh, the most fundamental questions that we have. I ended up, due to circumstances, in doing physics and astronomy, but I later realized uh, that this arranged marriage is actually okay. to my first love. <laughs> and physics nowadays allows us to explore the universe scientifically, but it unravels something that has a deep philosophical meaning and should not be taken for granted. Uh, one can adapt the mechanistic approach and basically say that we are trying to figure out how the watch is assembled and how it operates. Uh, but to me, just looking at this watch and the fact that uh, it has this structure and organization, the fact that it looks so beautiful, has a special value in itself uh, that is worth thinking about.